As a kid, I was very interested in space. Everybody else was reading the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, and I was reading all of the Tom Swift novels. And at one point, I had all 30 of the Tom Swift novels. My mother gave them away, and now I'm gradually buying them back. One room in our house was my chemi chemistry lab, and I'd do chemistry experiments and try to make things blow up or do volatile reactions. And so when I came across Heinlein, I was uh, noticing that he paid a lot of attention to detail, even though he had a lot of interesting plot twist and drama. And I was just, that kind of fixed me into being a science fiction slash space junkie. I didn't really, at that time, intend to become a space artist. I'd always been doing art. Those were kind of my foundation of get, getting interested in those sort of things. I uh, was able to get a job being trained as a technical illustrator with E-Systems in my hometown, Greenville, Texas. And E-Systems built these planes that were retrofitted 747s that were known as the Doomsday Planes. The president and the, his battle staff would always have one of these available that they could go up in on a moment's notice. And they trained me to be a technical illustrator. I was around a lot of um, aeronautical hardware and saw how the things were built. And then I found out about a job as a technical illustrator at Johnson Space Center. I thought, you know, this, this is an excellent opportunity. I love space, you know, I'd always done that as a kid. I ended up working on the Orbiter Crash and Rescue Manual. And it was a manual for firefighters. So if the space shuttle crashed anywhere in the world, firefighters would know where to cut into the space shuttle orbiter to save the astronauts and what sort of dangerous chemicals were on board and such. It had every system on the whole space shuttle I ended up having to spend two and a half years researching every system in the mid-fuselage, the payload bay of the orbiter, and then a bunch of other systems as well. And it taught me how a spacecraft was built. And so that was a very intensive kind of apprenticeship tutorial in how space, spacecraft are built. And then going from that experience I discovered there were some guys that were painting concept art for Johnson Space Center. And I go, so you've got guys painting science fiction, getting a steady paycheck, and, and so I, I managed to finagle my way into that, that group. And these guys were real old school guys who had been painting with airbrushes and stuff for 20 or 30 years. And I looked over their shoulder and learned a lot of their techniques. And then from there, kind of my career began. Uh, back in about 1995, I became very aware that the digital tools to create art and 3D models and such were getting to the point where I could create, or where people could create, where I would hopefully be able to create at that time, but people could create artwork that looked like my paintings. And I thought, okay, um, I see where this is all going. And at the time, I was working for a company that was very supportive, but they were not anxious to do the investment. And so I ended up selling a painting I had and buying a whole new computer setup that I could do it on. And so at first, I had my computer set up at home, and I told my boss, I said, you know, if you want me to do art on the computer, you can rent time on my computer, and I'll go do it at home. And he said, no, 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 we'll buy stuff, we'll buy printers and scanners, and we'll do other things, and we'll collaborate with you. And so I worked from home for several years on my setup with their tools around them, and I discovered that there were certain pictures that were very hardware intensive that I could do much more complex, intricate pictures digitally than I could by painting. The problem is, unless you're just a really, really careful, gifted digital artist, they still look very digital. 
you have to work hard to make them look romantic and like paintings. And so the paintings with the people and the paintings with the landscapes, I, I kept gravitating back to the paintings on those. But eventually I went full tilt digital. Then I ended up using a uh, digital stylus and a pen and started being able to paint digitally, which enabled me to use a lot of my traditional painting techniques in a digital manner. You always would have a client that wanted you to, could you move the spacecraft over just a little or something like that? When you do a painting, there's no undo. You know, I, I kind of stopped calling myself an illustrator about 10 years ago, and now I tend to refer to myself as a visual storyteller. Every piece I do, and the piece that I did of the space surgeons on the moon, um, to me are like one frame out of a movie. And so I go, what is the movie? What happened before this scene and what happens after this scene? And I, I kind of play the little movie through my head and then I think, okay, what is the best point to try to capture as many salient points in describing the narrative and then depict it in a visually arresting manner while capturing as many engineering and science accuracies as I can. I evolved in a very non-traditional manner as an artist. When I finished my art degree, I'd already been doing paintings for NASA for two years. I started out fairly self-taught. I got an art degree and it ended up polishing up my sensibilities as an artist a lot. But it didn't really change me. So I don't have an art school background. I mean, I have an art degree, but it was more, I just got it because it felt like I needed an art degree. But I've always liked telling the stories. And one thing that I'm a little, I still haven't done yet that I really want to do, but I haven't gotten it all together yet, is to do a graphic novel. I did do a NASA comic book one time. It's an eight-page comic. I wrote the story. I came up with the concept for it. I penciled it. I inked it. I colored it. I lettered it. I had it printed. It was just a one-man deal. It was meant to be kind of an inspirational piece to show there's great things that can happen in the future and you just never know what's around the next corner. And it was called JSC 2069 because it has some communications from 100 years in the future back to Johnson Space Center. Well, it wasn't 100 years. I'd pin picked 2069 because of the moon landing. It was just kind of significant. They were sending signals through a wormhole, data through a wormhole, because wormholes can be created for just a bare instant and they're almost infinitesimally small. But I thought, well, if you can't send physical matter, what if you could project a stream of information through a wormhole back into the past? And so, that was kind of the premise of how this thing worked. And so, yeah, I love, I love telling stories. You know, my favorite first third of the time that I spend on producing a piece of art is the research. And I will spend many hours calling up scientists and when I first did it, scientists and engineers, when I first did it, they were like, well, what do you want to know, you know? And it's kind of like, eh. But then after they had seen my art and recognized what I was trying to do with what they were telling me, they were very anxious to help me. And over the years, I kind of developed a network of go-to people on Mars or Mars geology or Earth's climate or various pieces of hardware. There was a guy that was the spacesuit guy at Johnson Space Center when I was trying to design a new spacesuit for a 
piece of concept art that he would help me brainstorm all of that for a, maybe a planet that hadn't even been visited yet. And these, these folks, I always felt like were kind of part of my team. I, I know they helped other people and like that, but these were people I used repeatedly over the decades. I really enjoy the research part of it as much as I enjoy the concept development. And ironically, one of my least favorite things to do with the artwork is actually paint it. You know, it's kind of like, I gotta paint it now, you know? And it's nice, I enjoy the painting and I especially enjoy being finished with the painting. This was a, uh, a 3D model, but the suit, I came in and just repainted pretty much the whole suit. You know, it, it's, it, it was just kind of rough. I designed this rover completely. The rigid uh, ribs right around here um, clamp together and this fabric in here can inflate later and even the front of it can inflate later. And some of these images that are, it's kind of cool because you can just zoom in on an image and that's a whole another piece of artwork just right there by itself. So I've done slideshows before where I just zoom in this was the cover for a uh, Mars working group that they had on exploring Mars a number of years back. Well, Mars has always been my preference as a, as a setting for my artwork. A lot of it is work that was commissioned by NASA, but I would grab, I, my best artwork I think is my Mars stuff. And it just reminds me of the desert Southwest. And I've always, I've taken car trips with my family through the desert Southwest and all of these different places with these geological marvels. Just the thought of having kind of space cowboys, you know, having people out there that are exploring what looks like Arizona or something wearing spacesuits was just always intriguing to me. On Mars, you have atmospheric perspective, you have weather, you have weathering, so that the geology actually has aeolian weathering and you have sand deposits and you have things that look more like what people on Earth like to see. There are some artists that do want to create the mystery of an alien landscape. But what I want to do is to make Joe Sixpack driving his tractor feel like when he looks like the artwork that he could be there. Because the people that the artwork is for in Congress and in the White House are closer to Joe Sixpack than they are to astronauts. They want to see something that is a visual story, what it's like to explore another planet. And they don't care as much about all of the nuts and bolts. I care a lot about the nuts and bolts. I'll make sure they're right. Because when you go to your family and you say, I want to go to the Grand Canyon, you don't say, I want to go to the Grand Canyon because we have a great station wagon. I had worked with IMAX before, Tony Myers and Graham Ferguson. Graham is actually, I think, like the patent holder on the IMAX camera when it first came out. And they'd flown a lot of missions in space and done this marvelous photography you've seen from the shuttle and the ISS with IMAX cameras. And uh, they ended up finding out about me through my NASA contacts that overlapped with their NASA contacts. They hired me to do some artwork for, I think it was Destination Mars. And I ended up coming up with a spacecraft for that. But then they decided to do their very first fictional piece which was L5 First City in Space. Its working title was Cosmic City. 
they approached me not about doing concept art of the Cosmic City and all of the pieces that went with it. They wanted to know what the items look like with engineering drawings. They would feed these to Ex Machina in Paris and Fujitsu in Tokyo, and they would animate those because at that time, those two companies were the only ones that could have the crank power to do the IMAX quality negatives in a 3D format and do every little tile on the space city and all of the little spacecraft flying around. And so I did a series of over 20 engineering drawings where I came up with the space colony, I came up with all of the spacecraft, the little pods that fly around on the comets, the industrial area, cross sections of how all of the different utilities worked. And so they built models of that. And then uh, I gave them guidance on the type of materials and such that they would use. When uh, they were first looking at the test shots for L5 First City in Space, they were looking at different 3D um, interocular distances, how 3D it was down in Galveston at the IMAX at Moody Gardens. And so I was in there with Graham Ferguson and Tony Myers, um, you know, helping them check out the, the way it looked. Then when the L5 actually uh, premiered, I was at the Lincoln Center up there and got to enjoy actually being around the people that were in the, the movie and all of the frou-frou that goes with that. So the, the cool thing about uh, this picture is, is even though it looks like a 3D piece, this was completely done in Photoshop. And uh, I just kind of started with a concept and built it all there. And so things like, if you look here, see the shadow, I wanted a shadow cast from the sun back in here. I could just put a shadow layer in right here. And then I painted these rocks separately on a different layer and you'll see the rocks, you know, they kind of appear and disappear. This is a disc, a whole different disc around this planet. This is an accretion disc at the beginning of the formation of the solar system. And let's see, I wanted to tint this area a little bit. Or actually, that's where I painted in some, I guess. Where is the very background? And just very subtle moves where you can pop up things. And in a painting, you would come back and just paint it in with additional color. But in here, you can dial things in and out. Let's see, what have I got? Planet. See, I can just kill off the whole planet there. And sometimes that is handy when you have things like this disc here. Maybe the disc is a little strong and you want to tone it down. It's at 75 now, and I can go back down and change, make it a whole different look. And then I can go back and see that was too gaudy, so that's why I toned it down to 75. And those are the things in digital art that you can do where you sometimes overcommit in a painting. I, I've never been a good self-starter artist. I've always had to have structure. So as a commercial artist, the nice thing is, is when I know I'm done is when my deadline is. I get deadlines and it's perfect. And I love doing, I mean, I would do this even if I wasn't paid to do it. Yeah, I've been asked from time to time how I feel about the progress that NASA and just the world in general has made in space exploration. And I started my career as a very optimistic 22-year-old that just thought I was going to do these paintings and five years later we'd be on the moon. You know, I was very, very optimistic. And... Uh, you know, my whole career has revolved around helping NASA depict what the future might be like. 
Um, but it was kind of interesting back with the uh, great American eclipse that occurred in 2017. Um, I had done a painting of uh, the eclipse as viewed from the moon. And so the title of the painting was August 21st, 2017. And it showed a, a guy standing on the edge of this big crater and looking up at a full earth with a big shadow on it. And so I just posted it on Twitter, and I go, back when I painted this in 1989, I thought we would be a lot farther along, and then I go dot, 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 sigh. And I didn't think anything about it, and I went back about an hour later, and it had been retweeted like thousands of times. And I guess people were pulling up anything they could about the eclipse, and it ended up being retweeted like 9,000 times or more. And it's still being retweeted today, believe it or not. I think that we've gone through a little kind of a hiatus where NASA has been constrained a lot by the political cycles of funding that occur. And you can't point at any particular party uh, it, you just have to kind of point to the fact that every time a politician comes into the office, they want to put their mark on the way things are going. And so NASA is doing things on 10 and 20 year schedules for these long-term developments. And you have congressmen with what, two year cycles, senators with six year cycles, presidents four year cycles. And with all of these people messing with the NASA machine, it stands to reason that NASA is constantly taking two steps forward and one or two steps back and let's go a different direction. And, you know, so I can't really fault them. And I've worked with a lot of people in NASA that are just very ingenious, very enthusiastic engineers and scientists. Yeah, I wish that we had made a lot more progress, and I wish that I hadn't done 10 different paintings of lunar landers that had been proposed, that just the first one I did would have been kind of leading to what happened. And so a lot of my artwork still is science fiction at this point.